So if, if someone knows why there's a different HDMI on the computer, let me know on the TV. Okay, I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> All right, so, you know, we have this strange thing that we do every year. We sit down and we require our children to tell us what they're grateful for. <laughs> and we give us a great big feast that usually gets eaten in the 20 minutes that we have before the football game starts. <laughs> Why do we do this? <laughs> How did it get started? Why is it an issue? Why is it something that we would, you know, even think was appropriate? So, there's a whole lot of stuff from very long traditional past that I think comes from actually life experience. And then there's a whole bunch of recent research, which I will share with you today. So, one of the things that I have noticed in, in America is that <laughs> To about 1930, even during the Depression, we were just in, you know, incredibly productive as a nation, right? And then World War II came along and we were the most productive and we made a huge difference. And then the 1950s came along and we started kind of settling back on our laurels. And by the 1960s, we were a very different country. And one of the things that I noticed was that during that period between the 50s and the 60s, between World War II and Vietnam, actually, we had a shift in what was acceptable public behavior. And one of the shifts was whether it was okay to be spiritual in public, much less religious, <laughs> but to express one's spirituality. And another one was we changed from a mode of farming and, and, connect, and gardening and other kinds of ways of being with the, the, the land and the earth that was appreciative and honoring and blessing to, oh, it's a science. <clears throat> and we, we have to disengage our spiritual life and only use the intellect when we farm. Only use the economic model only use the scientific, biological, agricultural model, which at that point did not understand ecology, did not understand the, econ the interconnected web, which was introduced to the UUs in the 80s, the interconnected web, just to bring us into a more uh, a, you know, established context, if you will. So one of the things that I'm convinced of is when we forgot our spiritual relationship with the land, and we, when we forgot gratitude and appreciation and blessing of the land, was the beginning of the end of the productivity of this nation. And we are now, what technically, we're a third world country. We import more than we export. We are debt-based rather than you know, production-based and so on. And that's kind of scary. Uh, because we're supposed to be the greatest nation on earth, and something flipped here. So this is part of why, for me, it's really important that we look at gratitude, quite apart from what it does in our lives, our personal lives. And that's where I want to go next. So I have these beautiful sayings, and I'm going to invite someone from the congregation to read that, and if we need to use the mic, we will. So who would like to read what's on the screen? Okay, Jay will. He can do that. Yeah. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, <coughs> chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. Ah, we'll just let that one sit there for a moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of studies done, and you can't quite read the words at the top. It says benefits of gratitude. And this is kind of a map. When one is feeling grateful, when one is appreciating 
you know, another person or one's life, the first connections are immediate, emotional. You actually shift how your personality is functioning when you're in gratitude compared to when you are feeling want and upset. You have a social shift when you start being grateful and appreciative of the people around you, yes? In the relationship shift, which then affect your career and your you know, physical health. Another way to put that together is a little simpler. <laughs> when we are expressing gratitude, we tend to be more optimistic. Okay, right? If I'm grateful for what is, I'm more likely to expect more of good stuff than I'm grateful for. We tend to be less materialistic. There's a wonderful song uh, in the New Thought world, and it goes, I used to have a lust for more that bordered on greed. <laughs> then I started being grateful and saw I have more than I need. <laughs> right? And so we tend to start feeling much better about our lives and much better about what we already have more spiritual, we tend to feel that interconnection. We tend to feel connected with the all that is. We tend to be aware there is something happening here that isn't about me. And I don't know what it is necessarily, you know, in, in 12 steps it's that higher power. And, you know, we start feeling that more and more. And something very strange happens. We stop being quite so concerned about us. <laughs> We stop start acting out of who I think I am and what I think I should have or need or whatever quite so much because it's not our base anymore. We're starting to operate from a place of larger sense of self, which then, of course, increases our self-esteem in this weird way, right? I'm less self-centered, so I have more self-esteem. I love how that works. So the, the actual studies, there's a lots of numbers and percentages and all of that, but they all just say very much what we've been saying here. Um, there's an, it, it, the relaxation response generally kicks in when you go into gratitude. Isn't that nice? Oh, if you can't go to sleep, just start being grateful. Okay? <laughs> and depression can be reduced by as much as 35% with one gratitude visit for several weeks. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, patients with hypertension, counting their blessings once a week, reduce their blood pressure, okay, over a period of time. And sleep quality was improved, and that last line significantly correlated with vitality and energy. Can you see how shifting away from being okay to say, I appreciate all that is, may have helped to you know, put a damper on our lives and our culture. And if we begin to reverse that again, we may begin to see a whole different kind of experience happening. Who would be willing to read this one? Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> Gratitude is one of the sweet shortcuts to finding peace of mind and happiness inside. No matter what is going on on the outside of us, there's always something, too, we could be grateful for. Okay. I love that this is published by the HeartMath Institute. They're the people who have learned that there are amazing qualities of the heart. And that's part of why I got the scarabs for you. Amazing qualities of the human heart that can um, affect not only the, our physical body, but the world around us as we bring everything into coherence. Barry Neal Kaufman, does anyone know who this man is? Okay, he, his nickname is Bear, and he wrote a book that I discovered in the 80s called Sun, S-O-N, Rise. His kid was autistic, totally unreachable. And they, went, they did all the appropriate things, all the appropriate things, and then someone showed up who simply sat on the floor and modeled whatever the kid was doing. The kid did this, she did that, for however long the kid did it. Kid changed, she did that. And that was the beginning. By the age of 26, he was a Harvard graduate. They've gone on and done a lot of wonderful things. They created the Options Institute. And so Barry Neal Kaufman is definitely someone to watch. 
and gratitude was one of the keys because they realized every time there was a connection they felt so grateful <coughs> right and then they began to feel the gratitude for him as he was and their son flourished so when we express gratitude for the various people that are helping us an interesting thing happens on the one hand, it reduces their feeling of uncertainty. And you know how this is. If someone says, hey, thanks, that's, that's, that's great, you know? You can go, oh, yeah, and now I, I, I really am doing the right thing here, <laughs> and I'm doing it in a way that's useful. But the other one, it, you know, it, it's whether they can be effective, but it's whether they will ever be valued. How many of the people who help us are coming in, you know, kind of timid and not entirely sure they're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing? And, you know, they don't always know that they can be better for in the world. One of the things I so appreciated while I was overseas was the expressions of gratitude everywhere in every way. Um, you know, in, and the group I traveled with in Egypt was a highly spiritual group and a very caring group. And the, what would happen, you know, when we would arrive is there was always the, oh good, Americans, money. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're going to buy things. And most of the time we, we could, I mean, we went to, through probably four markets every couple of days. You know, there's no way you're going to buy something in every market you're in. And they, they were set up, I started calling it running the gauntlet. You're heading toward a, a, this beautiful spiritual site through a market. <laughs> and then back out through a market. So you know, how do we do this in a way that is not a put down, right? We wanted them to know that we appreciated that this was how they make their living. This is how they share their culture. But we also could not be buying something every time anyone asked. So we just started saying thank you so much for sharing. And what began to happen was everywhere we went, they started saying, oh, we just love you Americans. It was fascinating. In Egypt, to have them saying, we love you Americans was kind of cool. <laughs> So when we, you know, when we're working with waiters or maids or whatever, you know, all these people on these trips, you know, we're, we're being served constantly. And the thank yous were really appreciated. They weren't used to them. And that sort of surprised me. They weren't used to them. And they certainly weren't used to us trying, you know, Americans trying to figure out how to say thank you in their own language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, huge difference. <laughs> so what happens is the Pygmalion effect. This is, you know, it, it's a feedback loop. You start doing something that enhances something that it cre you know, creates more, which creates more, which en enhances you ultimately. So who's willing to read this one? Go ahead, Ed. Grateful living brings in place of greed. Sharing in place of oppression. No, try it the other way. In place of greed, share it. In place of greed, share it. In place of oppression, respect. In place of violence, peace. Who does not long for a world of sharing, mutual respect, and peace? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Brother David Spangel Rost, anyone read his stuff? Oh, such, such beautiful, beautiful, you know, Catholic monk, uh, and able to break through so many of the limitations of any, you know, religious tradition to capture the essence, the spiritual essence. And so if we can recognize that just being grateful about our lives, honoring that, Oh, and I did want to say to David, the word grace comes from gratias, which means thanks. And that in Latin, and in Spanish is gracias, and same word, and in uh, Italian, grazie, it's all from the Latin gratias, which means thanks. So grace, anytime you honor that moment and experience gratitude, you're experiencing grace. I had a great picture. <laughs> One of my experiences on this trip was an incredible connection with all forms of heron. 
<laughs> Especially egrets. Uh, you'll see some interesting pictures, but gratitude affects us all. Some of you are familiar with Emoto's water crystal work, and so this is one of his early, early experiences. He just, you know, he would take water and he would put 50 drops in each of uh, 50. Uh, petri dishes and then put those in a very deep freeze and then he put the microscope in the freezer <laughs> and so the only and the body the, the guy who was doing the microscope work would be completely wrapped up so there was almost no human heat in there and then the only heat would be the light at the an end of the microscope tube so this frozen little mountain of water goes under the microscope tube and it starts to melt if it's just plain tap water, it generally looks like the yellowish one. There's no shape at all. But what a variety of things he did. He did music, he did prayers, he did thankfulness. And this was the crystal that emerged under the microscope just with 24 hours of the words, praise and gratitude, <coughs> wrapped, taped to the jar of the water before it was frozen. That's all it was. So if water can shift like that just by being told, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, praise, gratitude, maze, yes, praise, more, yes, we love you, those kinds of things. Imagine what's going on in the whole universe and in the whole planet, because this is a water-based planet, right? Not only is the planet itself three-quarters of the surface water, it turns out there's water underneath, too, and, you know, we are, at this age, just about three-quarters water, too. So, if we were babies, we'd be about 90%. <laughs> Another Emoto experience was he took an experiment. He took cooked rice, and he invited people to do the same kind of a thing. And what was very interesting, this is the 27th day, the, the rice that's saying, I love you, is doing just fine. Yeah, and this has been done in classrooms and in churches all over the world over the last 20 years since this was put out. And um, it's pretty consistent. The stuff that is told, I love you, ends up turning into a, this lovely, malty kind of stuff. And the other turns into this awful, moldy, usually dried up brick um, and very black. And, and it, it doesn't seem to matter what the conditions are, as long as there is that difference in attitude toward it. Turns out that the very DNA of our bodies is affected by gratitude. Yeah, the, the bluish picture is how it looks when someone is stressed. They scrape it off the tongue of a stressed person. And then, you know, it needs to look like the diagram in order to be okay. And that's what apparently, what they've been able to see is that scrunched up mess stretches out and turns in, you know, it, it turns into the shape it needs to in order to replicate properly in the presence of gratitude. It also does so in the presence of joy and laughter. There was a series of uh, experiments done by the Army where, you know, with the Army they do all kinds of good things, but um, <laughs> they set the guys in front of a video, and the video had, you know, would go scene to scene to scene to scene, different scenes, and they had a timer down to the hundredth of a second. They scraped the DNA off the back of the tongue, and they put it, you know, under a microscope, and at the same time, they would, you know, take a photograph of the state of the DNA. Well, during the really intense scenes with suspense and anger and fear and all of that, the DNA just curled up just like I am. <laughs> and then during the joyful, expansive, loving, everything's wonderful, oh, it's so happy, the DNA did that. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't matter how far away it was from the guys. It was in the next room, it was on the next block. Finally, they put it out on a ship and took it out to sea for a little <laughs> way. Yeah, and it didn't matter. So the DNA changes how well it can replicate inside each of our cells, in part because we are being either stressed or not. Something to be aware of. And gratitude, as that one reading said, is the shortcut. 
Someone, a lot of people have done this experience. They put seeds on, you know, on a moist paper towel and, and they set it aside. And the ones they're cursing and ones they're blessing, right? And the cursing and the blessing up at the top. At the top, you can see the blessing does well and the cursing doesn't. And the other one, the, the cursing one is the uh, kinda, and the other one, yeah, it's doing much better. So talk to your plants. Let them know how much you appreciate them. And if you're growing food or herbs or anything you're going to take into your body, do the same because you are enhancing you know, its life and vitality, if you will, as well as your own. Now there is this tradition of gratitude to the land that's almost completely lost in the current global culture. That was one of the things I've learned this year. I've now been in, in eight countries that I've never been in before, and in the urban areas, I might as well never have left the US. <laughs> yeah, really. It was the same as the culture. In the airports, in the downtown core, you know, the language was different, some of what was sold was different, but only some. <laughs> and, you know, the, a lot of people were dressed the same, you know, and everything. I really might not, it might not as well as left. So, we have spread this culture, and it's not just the American culture that has spread, because now we're drinking espresso, right? And we're eating omelets and crepes, and everyone around the world is drinking espresso <coughs> and eating omelets and crepes. It's fascinating to me. And the beer, oh, a craft beer. I'm in a little tiny town on the edge of somewhere in Italy, and there is this craft beer store. <laughs> Fascinating. So, you know, we've got this culture that's kind of taking over everything, and yet, in little pockets around the world, there are the remains of, or the last little vestiges of, cultures that are based on this realization that when we recognize our interconnectedness, and when we experience and express gratitude, something wonderful happens. So in Peru, up in the Quechua world, they call it despacho. And this is talked about in the uh, Papa Mama stuff, or, um, I'm sorry, Pacha, Pacha Mama stuff, not Papa Mama, Pacha Mama uh, world, and I have the website down there. So through Despacho, we thank Mother Earth for what she's given us. We give her knowledge about what we want to achieve in the next period, requesting her blessing, protection, and abundance. Isn't that interesting? So we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And because you are who you are, we're anticipating this, and we you know, appreciate receiving that blessing. So we're giving thank you for the blessing ahead of time. The spiritual connection established extends from the earth, mountains, and nature to the universe itself, generating a healing effect and balance in the participants. When we stop saying thank you, we get off balance. When we start feeling that gratitude and allowing it to expand through our actions and words, then we are restored to balance. And when we are restored to balance, then the body heals. That's a huge part of the healing process. And so that if the technical nerve terms there, there are three bands. Yanke, the physical body, Munai, the emotional body, and Yache, the spiritual body. Yeah. Who would read this one, please? Right. Oh. There's no such thing as too much gratitude, because the more of it you express, the more reason you'll be given to express it. In the universe. Oh. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah. You know, we were taught in that period from about the mid-50s to the mid-60s to not be over-expressive, to kind of hold back a little bit, you know? And I think we did ourselves a great disservice when we chose and accepted that teaching. Yeah. Because we began a feedback loop, that Pygmalion effect, that started spiraling downwards. I've noticed whenever I limit something, whenever I hold back, whenever I say, oh no, you know, I better not do, whoops. <laughs> I better not, whatever, that is the sign that I'm starting to go downwards. Right? It's, 
I had a friend once who used to say, if you're feeling a little depressed, you're feeling a little lonely, just say yes and thank you for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say no for three weeks. <laughs> say yes and thank you for three weeks. It is. It will completely turn around a life to do that. So, what do we do? First, we're not taking anybody for granted, right? <laughs> we're going to say thank you. We're going to say I appreciate you. We're going to say, you know, thanks so much. All the different ways. You can, you can learn it in four or five languages if you want. <laughs> and then Ralph Waldo Emerson pointed out that when we give of ourselves in any way, that can be an expression of gratitude, but it also gives other people an opportunity to express gratitude. That was a huge thing for me. I didn't get that if I get, you know, if I allow myself to receive, I'm actually allowing something to happen that, you know, I didn't allow before, right? And if I give, I'm actually allowing someone to experience gratitude. Huge thing to get because, again, we were taught not to go there, all right? So if we can create opportunities for people to share from our lives and offer what is meaningful in the moment, Right? So when I was on the trip and, and if someone happened to be in cleaning a room or clearing a table or something like that, you know, I'd invite them to tell me about something they cared about. And of course we immediately became fast friends. Right? The woman who decided she needed to do something to my hair you know, considers me part of her family now. <laughs> she spent over an hour making it straight, and of course it doesn't stay straight. <laughs> You know, she and I had a lovely connection during that time about her family and about, she lives in a part of India that's almost in Burma, and I'm looking at this woman, I'm seeing, an, you know, someone from Southeast Asia, not someone from India, and I'm seeing a name that's from Southeast Asia, but her badge says India, and so we had to go into that conversation, but when we allow that connection to happen, that sharing just of a meaningful moment, we've opened up the heart, right? Another reason for carrying a scarab around. So one of the things to remember is it doesn't matter what's going on in our life. <laughs> we can still be grateful. <clears throat> Gratitude is not about circumstances. That's a tricky thing to get. We've been taught we can only react to what's out there instead of realizing that we're coming from in here. The second is, what am I paying attention to? If I'm paying attention to what isn't meeting my expectations, it's really hard to be grateful. <laughs> if I'm paying attention to the three or four things that are either meeting or exceeding anything I could hope for. One of the things we did on the trip is we went to this amazing hotel. It's the hotel that Agatha Christie lived in while she was writing the book, Death on the Nile. And of course, everyone on the group had to read Death on the Nile. But we, we didn't get to spend the night there because her suite goes $10,000 a night. I know, insanity. But it's a classic 1920s British hotel that's being updated. And they did a beautiful job of me you know, meshing the you know, Art Nouveau with the 21st century. It's just marvelous. And then the Indian and the British. You know, really, I strongly recommend the, cra the Cataracts Hotel at Aswan. Just go. <laughs> yeah. And we had dinner there. And we had dinner in the, the 1932 room. <laughs> right? And I have no idea why they call it that, except obviously it was open. And it had this huge dome and beautiful lighting, and, and a man was sitting at an upright piano in this huge space. It's a little tiny upright piano, playing out various things, and, and we're being offered this five-course meal. You know, one dish at a time, and then they take away the dishes, and they bring you another one. And there's multiple glasses and multiple forks, and the other people at my table are going, what do I do next? <laughs> right? And, and it's just this fabulous environment. It also was perhaps the worst meal I've ever eaten. <laughs> yeah, and for a whole lot of reasons that, you know, yeah. Egyptians trying to do British food for one thing, uh, <laughs> right, in, in 100 degree weather for another thing, and then they, they gave us a tour of the hotel which made us late for dinner, which meant the veal was overcooked, you know, little things, little things. But, I could have focused on the food, right? Have I been? No. 
Right. It was one of the most magical evenings of my life. Mm -hmm. And I strongly, as I say, recommend the experience. Don't try to buy dinner, though. <laughs> Give yourself an opportunity to go to the Cataracts Hotel with us one. But that, that beautiful kind of experience, where am I going to put my attention? Yeah. Where am I going to put my attention? And finally, when we're really sincere about any moment in our lives, we can find that gratitude piece in that moment. It doesn't matter how horrendous it felt in the moment. When we come back to it now and we reflect sincerely on that moment and on the outfalls from that moment, we can find the gratitude almost every single time. So, every time we do it, it enhances our experience. And if we're taking for granted something, it's hard to feel gratitude, <laughs> right? If, you know, we get something all the time, all the time, all the time. So on the day after I got back, I went to, I was in California uh, staying with the husband. And he and his wife were very sweet and let me leave my car there for the whole trip. And so I spent the night and then I packed up and I wanted, I just needed to move on, but I was hungry. So I stopped at a restaurant we used to frequent when I worked down there. And I went in and I ordered what I used to order 35 years ago. <laughs> and it was exactly what I anticipated. Wow. <laughs> Talk about gratitude <laughs> after seven weeks of never ever having what I expected, <laughs> particularly. But to get, and you know, 35 years later to sit down and say, this is what I'd like, you know? Yeah, another wonderful place, Hobie's in Mountain Dew. Um, so, <laughs> all right, but there's another piece, and that is if I feel entitled or if I feel like I've earned something, how grateful am I going to feel? But frankly, although I you know, do set up contracts and I do get paid, I never earn anything. <laughs> right? I give what I have to give, and people give. And for that, I am entirely grateful. Yes? Yes. So, one more. Um, <coughs> Gratitude is an art of painting and adversity into a lovely picture. Isn't that marvelous? I love this photograph. You know, here we are in drought-stricken Africa. They have mud houses, and they're making them absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you do a gratitude journal, a gratitude, your whole happiness, your whole life increases in, in happiness and joy. And so, here's some to-dos, make space in your family to express gratitude, and here's another one, to reflect on what they learned or are learning when there are difficult things happening, right? And finally, create a gratitude wall. <laughs> My daughter has done something like this. She has this little tiny blackboard that sits on the fridge, and she's usually up and out of the house before the rest of the family is up. So almost every day, not every day, because she knows the principles of psychology, but almost every day, you'll find a sweet little thank you note on this piece of, on this blackboard on the fridge. And often the kids will then come in and they'll write little things on that to say thank you. So some kind of a thank you wall, a gratitude wall, makes a huge difference. One more. We'll read this one. The more you are thankful for, the more you attract things to be thankful for. The perfect reader for the perfect <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yes, and that's the other piece, right? Our world turns around as we begin to expand our capacity for gratitude, and then we start to experience more and more reasons for gratitude. It is just amazing. And yeah, we, we become a magnet of these things that we have been grateful for, and more like that. And so if there's anything in your life you have felt like you don't have enough of, what's the first thing to do? Be grateful for what you have and what you've found. Uh, it's a huge, huge, huge next step. So this is why, before the Revolutionary War was over, Congress established the great day of Thanksgiving 
It was to bring about the fulfillment and the completion of what it was they had started. And this is why, before the war between the states was over, Abraham Lincoln called for a day of thanksgiving. It was the same thing. How can we be grateful for that which we are anticipating to experience by being grateful for what is already here and seeing it unfolding? And well before the Depression was over, Franklin Delano Roosevelt made it our annual event on the fourth Thursday to acknowledge how much we have and to be appreciative of that, knowing we will be creating more just by doing that. Thank you very much. <laughs>